Welcome back to the Joseph Graham Show. I'm excited today. It's actually kind of like a first date of boards because I've met you through a couple of mutual friends. Like I know Brian Bogart, Steve Sims. You just were at Michelle's event. Um, but for people that don't know you, Atiba, give us a little bit of your background, who you help, and what you do. Yeah. Hey, first off, Joe, man, great to hang out with you, buddy. Um, and, and yeah, we've got lots of mutual friends in in common, and and so awesome to be here. Um, I help everyone with messaging. Okay. The reality for all of us is we have an ideal customer and our ideal customer is sitting somewhere over here and we're over here with our product or service and they need to take a journey in order to get to us. And I help you figure out that journey and come up with the right messaging through video to help them take that journey to you so that they show up with credit card in hand, ready to buy. No, I love that. I love that because I've been an entrepreneur for about two and a half years. I've been doing a bunch of different stuff. And I think that's the hardest part because I think most entrepreneurs know who they can help, but actually getting them in your world, especially if you're starting out or maybe you don't mm -hmm. have the branding yet, or maybe you don't have the thing yet. So let, let's dig into that a little bit more. So like, say if someone was coming into you and they said, hey, I need help with this. And on, they've never done video, never done anything. How would you start to help them cultivate their message? Yeah, so that's, it's a great question. And, and here's the beauty. This has nothing to do with video. This has everything to do with communication, what I'm about to tell you, right? It doesn't matter how you're communicating your message. And that's the key, y'all. You're always communicating, okay? We are always communicating. And communication is marketing. Marketing is communication. And in order to master communication, you have to be obsessed with your audience. If you are married or have a significant other, you know there are certain things, if you say it in a certain way, the world will explode. Yes. Likewise, there are certain things, if you say it in a certain way, life would be great, right? Yeah, because you know your audience. Mm -hmm. You know your audience, you have to be obsessed. And, and that is one of the things that as business owners, we have to recognize our relationship with our ideal customer is just that, a relationship. And it needs to grow and you need to learn and you need to nurture your understanding of the relationship over time. So how do I find it? Say I'm like, I got the fuzzy dream and I'm an entrepreneur and I want to help, let's say, Dads take their kids to Disney, with their wives to Hawaii, build a life they love living. That's really broad. How do you help people like narrow it into more of a, a actual message that would resonate? I mean, it kind of resonates overall, but that's not going to like get you a specific client because everyone wants to go to Disney. Everyone wants to go to Hawaii, but the tools that they need to get there would be different. Right. And so I'm going to ask you some questions. You know, you've got to dive into, yes, people want to go to Disney, but why are they going to Disney? Who's going to Disney? Are they going to Disney and are they taking um, young kids or are they taking teenage kids? Those are two totally different parents, right, that you're talking to, right? Um, or is it adults going to Disney? Like, for example, I am looking forward to going to Disney which we're going to plan one of these years, my wife and I, we're going to plan going to Disney and we're going to get that Disney concierge, oh, right? Nice. Who shows up and plans everything out and ushers you everywhere. Yeah, I'm all in. But guess what? That's like a $15,000 a person experience. I'm a very different buyer than someone who's showing up with two little kids, mm -hmm. right? And so, so that's where you have to start to say, okay, who is it that I really love to serve? I like to term it this way, Joe. When you wake up in the morning, what type of client makes you jump out of bed and can't wait to talk to them? For me, it would be someone, because I do sales coaching. That's kind of my thing. So someone that mm -hmm. has hungry, that wants to become the best version of themselves, that's not afraid to put the work in, but just needs the tools to being able to do it. That would be the person that I would love talking to, not the person okay. that wants me to do the work for them because that's not my job. Right. Absolutely. And so then as a sales coach, now you, you ask the next question, what are they selling? Are they selling services? Are they selling products? Are they selling high ticket, low ticket, mid ticket? You know, what, what's the, 
What's the range? Are they selling B to B, B to C? And so we start asking all of these questions to dial in. So like, for example, my agency, right? My done for you agency serves cash-based regenerative medicine doctors um, that are orthopedics or uh, pain management or functional med. Very specific. We know exactly who we're talking to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? But I we think don't just that's the doctors. biggest key. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that's the biggest key because I like I know in the beginning I was all over the place. I'm like, took that tagline I gave you my podcast used to be called the 150K podcast because mm -hmm. I wanted dads to get to go to Disney with their kids and their wives to Hawaii. Like just for the life they love. But then I've dialed it in as it's gone along. So I just that's why I threw that one out there before. I think a lot of times entrepreneurs we want to help everyone, but that gets us to help no one. Is that been your experience? You need to have that super dialed in message. And then Correct. once it's dialed in, what, what would be the next step? So like once you have your avatar, you know who it is you want to deal with, who you want to talk to, who you want to help. How do you create the message around them? Because you're the expert. Like I have ideas, but this is your wheelhouse. So I want to know. There's a step in the middle that you're missing. So once you once we define who it is, then we have to part of the obsession process is we got to define what their pain points are. What actually is going on and and understanding their world. And so, Joe, well, here's what I'm saying. What I'm saying is maybe you realize, let's say you're dealing with the, the couple who wants to take that Disney vacation and have a concierge. Well, maybe we're the type that also does cruises. And so you're now looking for people who have bought cruises before. And maybe it's not just cruises, but certain packages on cruises before. Now, why is that important? Because it feeds into a pain point that I have, right? Which is I travel for luxury. I don't like to be, you know, jostled and 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 wait. And I, I want the ease of luxury when I travel. Right. And so yes, you're looking for that that person who who loves the airport lounge. Okay. So they spend money on those things to get out of the pain of what travel is like. Uh, so we're looking for all of that. So it's previous purchase behaviors. Why do they want these things? What are, what pain points? What is it going to relieve for them? Once you understand all of that, then we can start crafting messaging. Okay, so we know who, and then we know why. Then we can start crafting messaging and saying, because your messaging has to talk to their pain points. That's one of the biggest issues that I see all the time. So I, I just did this... Um, uh, I was at a mastermind and we did the speed networking thing. And, you know, we have like a minute and a half at each person and I get to one guy and he says, and I tell him what I do. And he says, oh my gosh, you know, I do um, uh, designs for packaging, for physical product packaging. And I'm having such a hard time. I mean, we've been in business a long time. We've had a lot of success, but now I'm having such a hard time selling it because we're using AI to help us design packaging. And I mean, it's revolutionized the way we, we do it, but I can't get customers to care about AI. I'm like, yeah, because they don't care about AI. Right, <laughs> Because right. that has nothing to do with any of their pain points. And so he wants to communicate how great they are because they're using AI and how much better that is, but the customer does not care, yeah. right? And that's where we go back to being obsessed. What do they care about? The customer cares that they're going to get a quality product and they're going to get it faster. Well, guess what? AI lets you do that. That's all you got to tell them. Mm -hmm. Stop yeah. worrying about talking about AI. You, we get so caught up with the shiny. We get so caught up with uh, what we think is great and exciting. But what you said there is the key to sell I've been teaching for years. They don't care about your product. They don't care about your service. They care about no. what it does for them and how it affects them. And yeah. once you dial that in, they'll pay you money. Like you just mentioned, you pay more to go on trips. I pay more to go on trips that are nicer. I want to stay in the El Palm in Palm Beach. I want to stay in the Hyatt yeah. in uh, Poipu, Hawaii, because it's nice. I don't have to do anything. I get up. Everything's taken care of for me. Now, there, my, there's other people that just want to go hike in a van. That's cool. I'll hike here, but I'm still going to stay in a nice place. You know, you got to right. know your audience for sure. Correct. Correct. Absolutely. And and so that is the most, you know, if you're listening to, to Joe and I today, that is the most important thing that I hope you take away is 
being obsessed with your audience and really dialing and understanding and creating a relationship. I say it all the time. You need to know what their poop smells like. Like that's how close you need to be to them. Okay. You need to know that they ate what for lunch. Now they smell like that for dinner, right? That, you you got to know that because when you get to that place and people come to you and they, they're like, I feel like you've been in my head. You know exactly what I'm thinking. Yes. Because ultimately no one will buy from you, Joe, and you know this, but no one will buy from you unless they trust you. And no one will trust you unless they know that you care about them and y'all value the same things. Well, that means when they, they say you value the same things, what it really means is you value what they care about. Yeah, yep. Business and sales is always about the customer. That That's what people are talking about when they say the customer comes first. It's not that you don't care about your employees. It's not that you don't care about your business. But when you take care of the customer, everything else falls into place because Correct. you've designed a package or plan for them that makes sense. So what do we do after that? So we, 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 we know them. We know what their poop smells like. We know everything about them. <laughs> now we're starting to try and craft messages because I know a lot of entrepreneurs have really, really great ideas. But they're yeah. not always good marketers, they're not always good messengers, they're not always good salespeople. So how do you help them start getting comfortable crafting that message? Yeah, yeah. So the next piece of this is you have to get over yourself and stop looking at the end of your nose. Uh, most of us look at the end of our noses and the end of our noses says we've got payroll to meet, we've got mortgages to pay, we've got bills to pay, and so somebody needs to buy today. And that's what I, what comes across in our messaging. Okay, everything is buy now, buy now, buy now. Hire me, hire me, hire me, right? And and I get it. I, I get it. And even internally, it's a big thing. Like we're going through this thing right now where I'm, I've got some new people who are doing messaging and they're learning messaging. And we're going through messages that literally are being sent to me on LinkedIn and say, okay, evaluate this message. Why is this a message good or bad, right? And it's showing them that 99% of the messages that we're getting are selfish messages about what the person who sent it want. Book a call, right? I can solve your problem. Book a call with me. Like you don't even know I have that problem. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yep. Yep. And so so the next thing is get over yourself and stop looking at only the end of your nose. See past that. You need, you need to be able to see past the end of your nose into your client. And now we once you can do that, we talk about there are three buckets of content that you need to create when you're doing your messaging, Joe. Three. Okay, three. This works on every platform, y'all. This isn't just about YouTube. This isn't, isn't just about video. This works on every single platform. Three buckets of content. Why, how, what. And a piece of content can only fit in one bucket. Now, how do we define that? Why content is that's the philosophical content where you're sharing your values and you're sharing why your your values and their values line up. Why the thing that they care about, that there's their pain point, why you're saying it is important, why it needs to be solved, why you believe in it too, why the world will be a better place if we could all go to airport lounges, right? Well, that isn't actually true because we want to keep people out so that the airport lounges. Correct, correct. I understand, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> right in in truth but it's why is that important that's your why content okay the next bucket is your what content the what content is sorry next bucket is your how content excuse me your how content your how content is how you do something usually a small part of whatever it is that you do Right. So I may um, show you how to create CTAs for your your messaging, not, not how you do the entire thing, but just this tiny little piece. Teach them something. Give them the steps on how to do something. Right. Because what we're doing is we're building no like and trust. What we're yeah. doing is showing that we value what you value. We know what, what we're talking about and can give you good advice and then we get to the what content and this is where most people create only what content that's the end of the nose 
And I want to reframe that because the what content is where you get to say, hey, come look at my thing, right? Come look at my thing. But here's the deal. I want to reframe that come look at my thing in this way. And I want you to think about it, y'all, in this way. How? No, sorry. Would you like my help with that? Your what content is asking, would you like my help? Because if you ask, would you like my help? And someone raises their hand and says, yes, I would like your help. Guess what you got? A new customer. If you say, click my link and buy my thing today. Yep. You got nothing. Okay. So I want you to rethink how we look at that. Now, there are tons of different ways that you can say the phrase, would you like my help with that? Right? But, but it's the essence behind it. The essence behind it that, that works in that line of why, how, and what to move someone through from not knowing you to knowing you, liking you, trusting you, and walking through the door with credit card in hand. So I have a couple of thoughts on this and questions. One, I've yeah. actually gotten more clients from the first two than from the last, like literally before I even get to the last, but percentage wise, do, is there, and I know it's probably different for everyone, is there like a ratio of how you do it? Because like you said, a lot of yep. times all I there see is. on Facebook is join my group, buy this, click this link, do it there now. Is. There's only 10 spots left. There's two spots left. And I'm like, really, dude, you're making it up. People know this is fake. Yeah, there, there absolutely is. And we can talk about scarcity too. There's an ethical way to use scarcity, right? Mm -hmm. Because Sometimes things are scarce, okay? Yeah. Um, and so there are ethics there. Um, so your why content should be 70% of the content you produce. 70, seven, zero, 70. Your how content should be 15% of what you produce. And then your what content, would you like my help with that? 15% of what you produce. So clearly 85% of what you're producing is value added content where you're not even asking for anything, which is why you're going to get more clients from it. Yep. yep. Because right? they're connecting with you. Yeah. They're connecting. They're and not feeling the toll. Yeah. Exactly. Right. 85%. Yeah. Only 15% of the time. So we'll be trying to get them off of a platform and onto our platform. 15% of the time. Most yeah. of us do it 85% of the time, and that's the problem. That's why people tune you out. Oh, he's just asking for something. She just, she's looking for, for a dollar again, right? Now, speaking of, of scarcity, there is a way to do ethical scarcity. I never will tell anyone to, to make up scarcity of, you know, buy now or it's going to go away. Um, I was with uh, Mike Phil Sane, um, a couple of weeks ago, and he, he actually taught a masterclass on ethical scarcity. It was brilliant. And one of the things that he, he talked about in there, and I'll share for you, is they change their prices of their programs at 12.30 a.m., so right after midnight, okay? that They standardize it. That's when they change the prices. He's done it for that way forever. And so he says, this price is guaranteed until midnight. Fair. Because you're changing the price. You just can't change it right back to the same thing or have the same price because th that that's the difference. Like I did a group coaching program. I said, it's going to be 10 people. I mean, I'm doing it's 10 people it's because I want to make sure I help everyone in the group and 10 is a good number for that group. But yeah, it wasn't like, oh, there's 10 people. There's five left. You better get in. It was, hey, this is legitimately what it is. And if people can see that energy, I think it's like you mentioned before, intention and energy. Like the people yeah. that I've gotten, like I had a video on, describing between a, so it might've been a how one, the difference between a sales coach and a sales trainer, because there's some differences in my head mm -hmm. on it. And I had a girl reach out and go, Hey, can you help me? I need you for X, Y, Z, because I define stuff and I gave information. I didn't know that's what I was doing. Like I was just, I do a lot of reels and I was like doing some teaching, but I didn't know, like, I didn't know I fell into that box with it, but it's just making more sense now because normally and I think a lot of entrepreneurs deal with this. When you say the, hey, buy my shit, buy my shit, all of a sudden, though, you get nothing, like cricket. But then the stuff you do, like 
little weird things that you think aren't going to get anything and you get like 80 comments and 100 likes. And I think, again, it goes back to they need to trust you. I think that's yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Uh, and see, so what we teach uh, and what I teach is the theory of content. There's so many people who teach you content strategy, and we do teach content strategy as well. Uh, and content strategy is important, right? But there are a lot of people who have tried content strategy. They they had a posting schedule. They came up with pillars and topics, and they went out and they created posts and they posted them all, right? And yeah. they said it didn't work. And then somebody came along and said, well, that's because you didn't tell any stories with it. And so now they added story and then they did a little bit better. You got a little bit of engagement. So, but it still didn't affect your, your bank account the way you wanted it to. And it's because you didn't, what we've been talking about so far is all content theory. And that's the missing piece that I've realized for so many people who are creating content is they don't even realize that there is theory behind what we're doing. And it's in the understanding of the theory that we master the creation and the messaging because we know why we're doing what we're doing and why it works and or when we do it and it doesn't, we can link it back and understand why. Mm -hmm. No, I like that. Okay. Well, and I think when we're most, and I don't like to buzzword, but when you're most real or authentic and you're just posting what really you're passionate about because you're obsessed with helping them using your terminology there and you do that, that's when that really connects because now they're seeing the real you. They don't smell the sales breath, commission breath, any of that crap. And the theory behind it is you want to have the people there as excited about doing what you're doing because they're going to be your best clients. They're not going to be chargebacks. They're not going to be headaches. And then you can build a business you love waking up to. I think yeah. everyone just tries to hit the get rich quick button. And I teach people in sales this all the time. The work you do now shows up three to six months down the road. Doesn't mean you won't get a sell before then, but that consistency over time yeah. establishes yes. you as a uh, an expert. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, buddy. Yeah. No, I like that. So, So we're talking theory, and then we're talking – so you do a lot with theory, but so I, I know that you probably have a strategy in place with it. There's reasons why we do each step. So once we get the theory down, right, once we are obsessed with our people, we understand what it is that they need, how we can help them, and that we're a good fit. And if not, we refer them to someone else because we're not going to waste their time or ours. I know that's mm -hmm. a crazy thing to say in that vertical space, but I don't want to have a client that I can't help because it's just going to be a bad day. So then how do we start setting up the content structure once we get that in place? Or did I miss something in theory? Because again, you're the expert. I'm deferring to you on that if I missed a piece before, if I'm trying to jump ahead. Yeah, no. So once, we, once, we've, once we're able to map that journey, because that's what why, how, what is. It maps the journey for people to go through, right? Based on the pain points that they're in and what is important to them. Now, now that we have that, we start to look and say, okay, now we can talk strategy. Now we can start to say, okay, what are the topic pillars that we're going to cover? And how are we going to plan those out? How do we plan out the why, how, and what, when we're actually posting that stuff and what channels we're posting it to? That's when all of that starts to come into play. Okay. But not until after we've done all of the upfront work. Yeah, yeah, right. put the work in beforehand. Okay. I can't because just put a video and get what I want. No. No. Um, and and it's hysterical because people believe that. There was a um, there was a lady who reached out to me after seeing me on on a podcast, um, and which I'll invite everybody to do as well on LinkedIn. And she said, you know, our YouTube channel just isn't working and we're not getting the results that, that, that we wanted. I mean, we, we created some videos and we think they were really great videos and we put them up there and, and it's just not doing what we thought it would do. And so, okay, well, I, I, I'll be happy to just take a quick cursory look at your channel. What's your channel? Uh, she gives it to me and there were two videos on her channel. Two. Wow. And the most recent one was at least four months old. Uh, there's your problem right there. <laughs> and so, yeah, it, it, you know, it's you can't. You're not just going to create. There is no one piece of content that is the smoking gun, 
that's going to be the the it piece of content. It just doesn't happen. And it doesn't, and you think about yourself for a moment, okay? Um, as you're listening to us, I want you to think about yourself. Did you see one car commercial that caused you to buy your car? No. No. You may have seen a car commercial. Then you saw the car on the road. Then you probably saw another car commercial. Then you went to the website. Then you went to the show. There was all of these touch points that happened. Okay? Why do you think big companies sponsor arenas so that you hear their name? Coca-Cola Arena. So that you're constantly hearing their name because that one cute Coca-Cola ad with the polar bears is not enough to get you and keep you from drinking Coke. I just dated right. myself because I don't even know if they show those commercials anymore. <laughs> it pictured Christmas. You made my day because they always came out at Christmas. Like now yes. anytime in Coca-Cola got me with it, like their branding made me think of polar bears at Christmas. So that makes sense. Right. And so, yeah, so it's a consistent thing. You have to create content consistently. Now, that scares most people. It does. It, it terrifies most people because it's like, well, I don't want to be an influencer. I'm not talking about being an influencer. Like that, There's no money in being an influencer, okay? So we're not talking about that at all, right? But what we are talking about is, is creating content for your audience on a consistent basis that you can keep up with. Um, my strong suggestion, if you're not a content maven, which 99.9999999% of you are not, batch your con con content, mm -hmm. okay? Take your calendar out, whether Google Calendar, if you're using a paper calendar, whatever it is, find four hours in a week that you can block, same time, every single week, block it out, and that's your content creation time. Don't let anything get in its way. Block it out. That's the only way it's going to get done. Okay? Uh, and I'm telling you that because I do that too. So I'm not giving you some advice that I've never followed or don't follow. This is what it takes. Block out a batch amount of time. Um, if you can do longer, maybe you can do it every other, um, you know, every other week. Right? I have one friend, he does it once a quarter, but he batches two days once a quarter. Oh, wow. Yeah. Right? I think that's a bit much. <laughs> <laughs> I drive myself nuts creating that much content in a row, but that works for him. And that's the thing. You got to find your rhythm. He creates 90 days worth of content in two days once a quarter. Interesting. Okay. I, I, I'm I one of the 1% people because I like creating content every day. But I do repurpose like this podcast will be repurposed into reels. I'll do walks and I'll talk. I'll do long form, short form, but I'm a little bit of a different type of – that's just how I flow. But I know most people are like, "Why? how do you get on camera? All this, I'm like, I just hit play. But how do you help people with that mental block? Because they want to yeah. do it, but then people are still caught in their head of – what will people think? Like I lost that in middle school when I was singing Phantom of the Opera and lost my voice in front of 400 kids. At that point, it couldn't get worse. Like my voice cracked in your middle school and it's a height of hormones. So <laughs> after that, getting on camera, now what, what am I going to do? Say a word not, wrong? Not a big deal. Right. <laughs> not a big deal. Not, not a big deal. Um, yeah. And, and it is a big deal for a lot of people because one, there's the fear of public speaking um, that, that exists and it's a real thing. Um, at least real in the fact that you think it's real. Um, so that's one. And then two is something that especially, especially for people of our generation, okay, we have what I call the news anchor syndrome, where we grew up watching the evening news. Mm -hmm. And on the evening news were these anchors who were just about perfect. Right. They got every word right. They said everything. Per I mean, it was it was genius watching them. Hell. And then that either rolled into or before was Pat Sajak and 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 Alex Trebek on Jeopardy. Right. And, and so you have these people that you're watching and, and it's like, man, they're like perfect. And so in our minds. Conscious or unconscious. That is the 
standard by which we judge ourselves, okay? Those two things are both fallacy. Mm -hmm. Absolute fallacy, okay? And here's why. Number one, and I, and I say this to people all the time, if your ideal customer walked into your place of business, called you on the phone, had a Zoom meeting with you, and asked you a question, what would you do? Everyone says, I'd answer it. Right? I said, so you wouldn't run to the bathroom and check your makeup? You wouldn't go outside and run 10 miles to try to lose five pounds? You wouldn't go change your clothes? You, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't check your hair? You wouldn't do any of that stuff? No. I'd, I'd answer it because they were here. Said, exactly. And so when you're on camera, understand you're talking to one person, that ideal customer. I even envision that person sitting right behind the camera. And that is who I'm talking to when, when I'm answering a question and, and sharing something on video. I am talking to them directly, just like I'm talking to you right now who's listening to Joe and I. I'm just talking to you right now, right? And you say, oh, Atiba, I'm, I'm not real great with that, the whole fantasy side of, of picturing the person there. Then fine, no problem. Then do the next best thing. Put a human there, a real human behind the camera and look at them. Get them to ask you the question and answer and just have the camera recorded. Listen, your ideal customer wants to connect with you, the real you. The real you. If you stutter, they want to know that because they want to connect with you. I, I had a coaching session with uh, one of my doctors on camera earlier today, and he was struggling a little bit. And 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 I, I paused him and we talked about it. And he said, "Yeah, you know, I answer this question all the time in clinic, but here on camera, I feel like I need to say it different, right? Because it's on camera. I need to say it." A I said, "No, no." Say it the way you say it in clinic. Mm -hmm. Let them connect with the way you say it in clinic because when they come in, that's what they expect. That's what they were looking for. So if you are super stuffy here on camera and they come in and you're super casual, they're going to have a disconnect. Mm -hmm. And when they have that disconnect, you ruin trust. And if you ruin trust, they won't buy. 100%. 100%. Rewind this, listen to this last little piece, guys, because if you just gave you a gold, like liquid gold, when you're talking to someone, when you're there, if you're sitting like we're talking here right now, I'm not trying to be professional or be a certain way. We're just having a conversation. And when you're talking to your ideal client, it's the same thing because you want them to trust you. You don't talk to your friend in a very particular way. You talk to them like we talk now. You want to know, hey, we're going to act the same way. You know, like you have a hat on. I normally wear a hat. I just didn't grab it today. Like, but I'm not going to dress up or be something that I'm not. Like, I think that's the thing that we get on camera and we think, oh, I have to act this way. Like, I could tell people all the awards I have. They're right behind me. They can look at the freaking awards. I don't care. What they care about is how can I impact them and being the most authentically real you. That's gold. So, guys, rewind that again because everything he's been talking about, at to tell us, is – amazing but that part right there when you get that down it's it's fire because you can't you draw the right people and you repel the right people i don't want someone that's stuffy they're not going to work well with me i'm not going to do well with a you're going to laugh i'm saying i close ceos of fortune 100 companies all the time you will never see me in a suit except for at a networking event that requires it because the restaurant tells me I have to wear it. If the restaurant doesn't tell me I have to wear it, half the time I show up maybe in a polo or a T-shirt because I want them to see the real me. We'll get on a call, and I talk to them like we're talking right now. Like I don't do the whole I'm going to present to you now, and I'm going to tell you all these great things. Right, Dude, that was gold. Thank you. I just I wanted to make sure they wrote that down because I think so many times we try to be perfect and – being imperfect actually is better, I think. 100%. 100%. Right? Be real. Be you. So I do Be have a question. You. Yes. The hat. Because you have a Superman mm -hmm. hat on. So, so is there a meaning behind that? Or, or, or what's up with the hat? Because I like hats. So that's my question. 
Yeah. So, um, hmm, um, so there are a couple of stories here. So one, they call me now the video content Superman uh, because of the hats. Um, the I have over two hundred hats, two hundred Superman hats. Um, oh wow! So yeah, it is kind of my thing. Um, it is kind of the brand. It's what people know and, and have associated with. Um, started by accident. I'm not a Superman fan, so I love all you people who come up to me and say and want to have real in-depth conversation about Superman. I don't know anything. Okay. Um, as a matter of fact, I cannot even name a single actor that played Superman. That's how bad I am with with it. Okay. It literally oh. is the brand. Okay. Um, and but I love you for it. I love that you love Superman. And and here's my reality, Joe. Everyone is a superhero. Everyone is a superhero. And if you're listening to me say that to Joe right now, you're probably thinking, no, I'm not. I'm not a superhero. But here's here's my 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 truth to you. My truth to you is this. You were born and you have a superpower that when you live in that superpower, when you express that superpower, you become a superhero to someone else. So you are a superhero. And so I wear the hats. I wear the S because I can't see it. This is my symbol to you to let you know that I know there's a superhero inside of you and I want to help bring that out. Live in your superpowers. I love that. I love that. I actually just heard of a, um, I remember if it was a, it was a study. So they had kids do the same task. The first group of kids just wore regular clothes. Second group of kids got to put outfits on. They talked about whatever superhero they wanted. The ones that stepped into that power did the task father better and faster than the ones that just did. And all it was is that they embraced who they were in their mind. Because yeah. when you're a kid, you embrace yourself as a superhero. We get to be adults. We get to be boring. But I love that. I love that you need to be, embrace who you are, your superpower, what it is that you bring to the world. I think that's amazing. And, now, I, did, and I, I hope, too, that you've heard that through this entire podcast, right, when, as we're talking here. Yes, you're going to become obsessed with your, your audience so that you can message them, but you message to them as you. You. You have to embrace who you are. You have to embrace what you bring because that is your superpower and that is what makes you a superhero to those clients that you need to serve. That's gold. But here's the thing. that So now here's my next question because this is where my mind goes. People need to understand that they have a superpower, that they have that gift. I think so many times we hide behind the mask because we're afraid yeah. to shine true to who we are. How have yeah. you been able to, because you've embraced the Superman, you've embraced who you are. How did you get to that point? Have you always been this confident or did no. you have to build it over time? Yeah, it takes time. It takes time, Joe. It, it takes time and it's a process. Um, and it's an, it's an evolutionary process as well, right? Um and and it's it's one of it's, it's multifaceted okay um one of the biggest and hardest facets of it to know and understand is that everything that has happened to me has prepared me for this moment and the next one good bad or indifferent and so there are so many things in our history that we're embarrassed of there's so many things in our history that we want to hide. And I'm not saying that you got to go tell everybody all of your business. But what I am saying is that you have to be real and honest with yourself about your history, about who you are, about the things that you've gone through. Some of the things that you've gone through have been really great. Some of the things you've gone through have been really crappy. Mm -hmm. And those crappy things, as much as they were, they've made you who you are. And so it's to embrace the love of that crappiness in terms of how it's created you today, instead of the resentment that so many, so many of us hold because, because of it. See, because when we hold that resentment for things that we've gone through that weren't great, 
mm-hmm. we then also internally start to hold resentment against ourselves, which stops us from moving forward because we can't fully learn from that situation and grow through that situation. Okay. And so it's very, very important that, that we, we are able to truly look at our past. And, and it's, an, as I said, it's an evolutionary process because you're going to think you get it today. And then tomorrow realize, Oh crap, I'm still holding crap. And I got to go deal with yep. that. And then, yep. and, and you grow and you grow and you grow and you grow and you grow. Um, and then you said this earlier, but it's getting to that other side of my voice cracked as a teenager in front of 400 middle schoolers. Mm -hmm. I'm no longer embarrassed. It's getting to that, that other side of I've got to live to who I am and show up as who I am. So it was, and again, this was extremely hard for me. I am not from the U.S. originally. I came here when I was old enough to be young and young enough to be old, mm. okay, and had a really hard time adjusting, had a really hard time fitting in, had a really hard time belonging, right? Always felt like an outsider, always felt like I didn't fit, always felt like I, I wasn't one of throw on top of that being visionary and entrepreneurial on top of all of that too, which puts you in a whole different class of weird. Okay. Throw on top of that being an athlete and a nerd, like how many of those that exist, like an actually a really good athlete and a nerd, Mm -hmm. right? It was compounding, 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 compounding. And yeah, it created situations for me of really feeling almost invisible or almost wanting to hide and to hide who I really was and who I really am. Because every time I showed who I was, people didn't understand. Mm-hmm. Mm. I hear you, man. And, I hear you. And and you felt the rejection of people saying, I don't know that you shouldn't be that way. No, you shouldn't. No, that's weird. Look, I created a search engine in 1996. I had a search engine online before Google. That's badass. Okay. Now, it is now. But It is now. Yeah, yeah. I I was a weirdo. We were weirdos. Okay. And and, and that's been been my life. And so, yes, it, it has become, it has become this thing of learning, learning to own who I am, learning to own, heck, even my name, learning to own the responsibility, learning to to, to take that on and and walk in it. And now it's the shining the light of telling other people, hey, look, you can walk in yours too. You can walk in yours too. Yeah, that's brilliant. It's like the, I know people call it the hero's journey or the different stuff, but I think that's why as entrepreneurs, as people that want to change the world for the good, as people that want to impact, we had to be a little bit weird. We had to be outside the box because if we were in the box, we would never push the narrative. We would never change the diagram. Believe me, some of the stuff I went through as well, I didn't want to go through. Nine, 10 years ago, I was on, after being a successful salesperson, left a job, tried a different one, didn't work, was on food stamps, working two jobs, doing a bunch of stuff to being a top closer for a Fortune 50 company. I don't say that to brag now, but I say that to like, I can look back to where I was like, holy crap, this sucked. I don't ever want to be there, but I also know that's giving me the drive to when I didn't feel like that, I put the work in. When I didn't want to do it, yeah. I stood it. When I still just kept showing up and growing and being. Last question for you before I let you go. How much has finding the right network, because you mentioned masterminds and groups and stuff, mm-hmm. been instrumental for you in finding because there's a bunch of weirdos out there, guys. So I'm telling you, there's your groups out there. You just got to find it. But how has that helped you, a team? You know, more than I can can articulate in words. Um, way more than I can articulate in words. And it's it's a matter of being around people who may not necessarily get you, but respect you. 
Okay. Um, because we're all on our own journeys and we're all building our own things and we're all our own weirdo misses. Right. But I, I just left Las Vegas and had this experience in a room with 130 other people where I literally felt like one of the dumbest people in the room because some of the people in the room, if I said their names, you're like, oh, 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 like massive name people. And then I'm there sitting poolside with some of them and realize, oh, crap, they're actually nervous to talk to me right now. Yep. yep. It's such a weird dichotomy, but yep. Right? And and it's because that's their weirdness. They're awkward in that way. I'm awkward in other ways. And, and, and it's just like, okay, I can respect you for that. And, and so it's in those environments that you start to realize that I can just let it. I, I'm going to say this phrase, and, and it's going to conjure other things than what I mean, but I don't care. Um, you can let your freak flag fly, fly, right? You can just be you, whatever freak you are, just be you. And, and these people will say, okay, yeah, I get that. It's okay. You know, and it's one of the things I love um, about Steve Sims, to be completely honest with you. Um Steve, if you've never been to any of his events, he takes the the champion of being King Weird and mm -hmm. putting out there and 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 pushing the envelope of how weird you can be so that he can create a safe space so that you can actually express yourself. Without judgment, without repercussion, and with love mm -hmm. but people say cool yeah you're different but that's all okay that's who you are great awesome let me i can help you you can help me i love that about him that's why i joined the group he's the most authentic person and i don't use that in the cliches term like he's just himself he's very yeah he, i love that he cultivates that because it makes it to where you get into a place where you just have to be you which is good because that's what you should be. And just to mention to your point, I love that because I've been seeing as I've progressed as well, getting into the rooms and I'm looking at these people going, this guy's got X, Y, Z, this guy, or this girl has this and that. And all of a sudden I'm like, wait a minute, I actually belong in this room. And when I realized finally, yeah. and it took me years to get there, so don't hear what I'm not saying, but I realized I actually belong in this room. Yeah, this person's farther along in their journey in this, or maybe they're better at that, but I'm supposed to be here. The game changed and it took so long but. I got past myself of, I'm just going to come see who I can help, who I can serve, what can I bring to the table? And then also the flip side, because I think as high-performing entrepreneurs, we have this problem. I've been having to work on learning to ask for help because I've always yeah. been the top sales guy. I've always been the guy that's been the go-to guy. I've always gotten my validation, as our friend Brian Boger would say, from performance. And now it's like I'm getting into rooms where I'm like, these people don't need me. Like I talked to a guy that owns 11 businesses recently and he helped me with just so much. I was just pop, 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 pop. No, nothing he could get from it. But because we connected in Sims group, all of a sudden access opens up and then you open up to a world that blows you away. And then you're weird. Or as you said, let your freak fly flag. It's cool. It doesn't matter. Be you because really I would hate it if you weren't you. That would bug me. Like I read people yeah. for a living. I know when someone's being fake and when they're not, like that's just part of the sales game. And if you're real, I can vibe with you if you are not. And I'm cool if you're completely, totally think differently than I do, your whole world concept. I like finding out about people. Just don't be fake with me. That's the one thing I can't do. No, I love that. Ag agreed. Agreed, my friend. Well, let's do this. Where can people find you? Because I know they're probably yeah. like, hey, tell me where I can find a team. Yeah. So – couple things here. So number one, we started this conversation about being obsessed with your audience. So I want to give your audience a free gift if that's okay. And then tell yes, them where please. they can find. Okay. So here's what I've got for you. I've been creating ideal customer profiles since 2002. We've been pros at that for a long time. And so we've created the ideal template for creating your ideal customer profile all the different sections that you need to consider when you want to become obsessed with your audience. I'm going to give that to you for free. All you got to do is go to contentcoach.social. That's contentcoach.social. Okay. Then you can download it there absolutely for free. Okay. That's number one. Number two, 
Joe and I probably opened up a bunch of questions today um, for you in your mind, and I would love to help you answer some of those. And so go to meetatiba.com. That's meet, A-T-I, B as in boy, A, dot com. That's going to take you directly to my LinkedIn. When you get there, don't hit the follow button. Hit the connect button. Tell me you saw me here on Joe's show and ask me your question. I want to connect with you one-on-one, -on -one, person to person, human to human. I love that, my friend. Thank you, Atib. And we're going to put this in the show notes too. So when you download the episode, if you didn't get to write down this fast enough, Click on show notes. It will be there. We can send you directly to the link. I like making things simple and easy. Are there any parting words for our listeners that maybe we didn't touch on? No, not that we didn't touch on, but what I will tell you again is if you take nothing else away, obsession with your audience. That is the key to communication. I don't care who your audience is, whether it's your spouse, your child, or at work and your business. You've got to be obsessed with who you're communicating with in order to communicate effectively. And that, my friends, is what marketing really is. I love it. Thank you all for listening. I'm not even going to try and hop or <laughs> go over that because being obsessed with people you love and who you want to help is key to life. Go out, wake up to a life you love living. Atib, thank you again for being on here. And thank you all for listening. And until next time, go be